we are going to move to food security. This is kind of an update to the committee. And uh, I don't know what just happened to John Sales, but um, <coughs> Teresa, I think you're going to go first because you're here. It's good to see you. And uh, um, it looks like you're going to share a screen with us. Just want to say a quick hi. And uh, for those who might not have ever seen you in the committee before, you. Uh, you want to just introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, the sound is a little, I mean, it, it must just be the sound in the room. Um, I'm Teresa Snow. I'm the executive director uh, at Salvation Farms. And it's a pleasure to have been invited. Um, I miss being in that room. <laughs> well, you're welcome. You can come back now. <laughs> I would like that. Um, so I... Um, decided to prepare a, a PowerPoint presentation. Um, and I didn't know if Linda uh, would have that up for me or if that's something on my end that I pull up and navigate through. I think she made you co-host. Do you know how to share your screen? Yeah, so this is going to take me just a minute to get that together. So my apologies. Um, If you sit along, then you could drive. Oh, there you go. Good work. <laughs> it's just a matter of finding the files. So I just want to make sure um, uh, you're seeing what I'm seeing and that you're not, the screen is not Where's obstructed. A picture of kale. <laughs> Okay, great. Um, so again, I'm Teresa Snow. I'm the executive director at Salvation Farms. And um, our mission is to build increased resilience in Vermont's food system through agricultural surplus management. Um, and essentially what that means, and many of you are already familiar with our work, but I thought it'd be good to uh, provide you an update. Um, we're driven by uh, four primary goals. One is to reduce food loss on farms. And another is to increase the use of locally grown foods. Um, the third is to foster greater appreciation of our agricultural heritage and future. I'll bring John in. Um, and the fourth is to support a just uh, food system. And um, what we're really looking at is make, making use of an available resource. Um, so that being the available food uh, that um, and pretty high volumes is, is remaining on farms um, and using this available resource through partnerships um, to really build shorter supply chains uh, that increase the reliability and resilience in Vermont's food system. And, and through this really building models uh, that can be replicated and adapted uh, in Vermont through partnerships um, or independent of us or anywhere really in the nation. So I'm gonna try to advance my screen. Huh. Well, that's not working. Are you all still hearing me? Oh, there we go. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I couldn't advance my slide. There we go. So um, some of you may be aware that in 2016, Salvation Farms did the first uh, statewide study in the nation to try to uh, gather um, an estimate for how much edible uh, produce remains on our state's farms. And based on farmers' responses, uh, comparing that with census data, what we discovered was approximately 14.3 million pounds of vegetables and berries are lost on Vermont farms each year. Um, you can see vegetables and berries, it doesn't include any of our um, tree fruit because no orchards answered. So uh, this number is likely to be uh, considerably higher. Uh, what I find particularly interesting about this information and again, this is based on farmer estimates and farmers um, don't always know what they leave in the field. This is a bit from experience from being a gleaner and being in far many farm fields. Um, but farmers estimated of that 14.3 million pounds, 68% of it is already harvested. 
Um, and of course, farmers are going to see that because their labor has already gone into it. They're using their capacity and their infrastructure uh, to have this volume of edible food that for some reason um, is not making it to market. Um, but that shows an incredible opportunity that 68%. The reasons that food loss happens, um, you know, it's cosmetic issues, market fluctuations, there may be labor shortages, whether that's affordable or available labor, um, it could be capacity on the farm, it could be supply chain capacity. Um, and these are all things that you you're all are familiar with um, from hearing about um, supply chain disruptions uh, and thinking about local food system development. Uh, An interesting story about these peppers. Um, the reason these became available, and some of you may have heard me tell this story before, um, is that uh, this farmer only had a market for red peppers, and um, there was an Im impending frost, and, and all peppers start out green, in case you didn't know that, and then they eventually turn their color after so many days of maturity. Um, and so because of the frost, the farmer was like, well, let's pick all of these peppers, even though they're green, the market, ret the, the economic return on this will be good. Um, but because of the frost, everybody else picked their peppers. And so the market was flooded and hence there being um, this volume of surplus, beautiful bell peppers. So, you know, the, opportun the opportunity in Vermont, um, you know, we are serving approximately 19 million institutional meals a year. That's in our schools, our prisons, our hospitals, uh, veterans, homes and hospitals. Um, and we're spending approximately $10 million uh, to source fresh food from out of state. Um, we also have an estimated, uh, John will have better information than I do, but um, the projection from a Feeding America in uh, for last year, 2021, was around 11%, just above 11% of the population is food insecure. Um, and, you know, of this available food loss or available food from on farms, I think that the state is really capturing about 5 to 10%. Um, and it doesn't, this food doesn't have to be used for charitable purposes. It has a lot of potential within the marketplace. Um, so Salvation Farms approach, we glean. Um, we've also aggregated uh, surplus product, cleaned it, packed it. Um, we've done processing, particularly to make frozen product. Uh, we've brokered surplus food, so that's buying the surplus and then selling it to a paying market. Our primary market in recent years uh, has been the Vermont Department of Corrections. Uh, we believe that a lot of the impact of our work actually happens through experiential education, through engaging people um, with our mission and with our direct impact programming, helps them think about what their role is as an eater within the food system. We've done workforce development. We provide technical assistance that's in state um, and out of state. Uh, right now we're working with organizations in Rhode Island, Colorado, um, and we may be working with um, a network of gleaners in New Hampshire, uh, which is exciting. And the last piece is research. Uh, we do have some additional research that you can find on our website. Um, that's at salvationfarms.org. Um, I wanted to show you a little bit of impact from our work. We think, again, with that experiential education piece, it's that engagement of people in the process that creates real change. 88% uh, of Salvation Farms volunteers stated having more awareness about how local farms operate and the role <coughs> local farms play in our food system. And then we have a quote from Celeste that she really saw the supply chain of food in its entirety from volunteering with us. 100% of farms reported that Salvation Farms assist them in feeding more people in their communities. Um, you know, Black Dirt Farm in Greensboro, where we moved uh, 1,500 dozen eggs, uh, plus uh, some other products, you know, said that Salvation Farms helps them move um, some of their overstock out into the community with little added costs and unnecessary logistical challenges. And that's such a great point. And that's one of our goals is we wanna be seen as a service provider and a business partner to the farms that we work and work with and serve. Um, 
92% of food programs, and mainly those are food shelves and senior meal programs, uh, programs serving after school youth, um, you know, WIC programs, et cetera. 92% um, of food programs reported that being served by Salvation Farms increases their understanding and familiarity of locally grown in season foods. So again, this exposure to the food system, um, to what is locally seasonally acclimated helps us become more food secure as a population. Um, and the Danville Senior Action Center um, really liked this quote about what was the impact of working with us, that it enabled their sites to offer more colorful, nutritious variety than they could otherwise afford to do. Uh, we had another indicate that it forced them to use uh, recipes that they had previously avoided. Um, so we're really helping people um, increase their comfort with locally produced foods, which creates food security, uh, regional food security. I have two slides to talk about our workforce development impact, but I wanna acknowledge that this work um, we currently are not doing. Um, we do anticipate uh, adding some workforce development again into our programmatic work, but the last two years have definitely been transitional for us. Um, for four years, we ran a, a surplus crop food hub and job training program in Winooski. Um, and after participation, we surveyed, uh, we did pre and post surveys. We surveyed our uh, trainees to see what the impact was. Um, so on the left, you can see what types of skills do you feel you developed? Um, and we were really aiming for a workforce development program that didn't just teach one particular skill set for one industry, but we wanted folks to have uh, transferable skills, whether it's um, cafe or uh, restaurant, or whether it's a produce department, or maybe they're working in manufacturing or just warehousing. Um, all, of, all of these skills were delivered um, and trainees received exposure to uh, through our uh, workforce development training program. And then we provided um, certificates and trainings as well. So we got to see um, what the value of that was for these individuals. Uh, additionally, we wanted to find out, did the individuals through participating in this program, it was a 16 week program, um, did, were there any shifts in their self-esteem or their self-worth? And um, I'll give you a few minutes just to kind of process this information, but we saw increases um, in almost every category. And the scale here was a strongly disagree to a strongly agree. So um, on a scale of essentially one to five. And, and I did provide a PDF of this PowerPoint, so you'll be able to go back and reference any of this information um, after. So specific to 2021, our accomplishments, um, I will indicate that we had minimal direct impact programming. So Salvation Farm, you know, compared to previous years, um, uh, Salvation Farms works at two levels, at a system level, as well as at what we think of as, as a sy symptom or um, an event level. And our direct impact programming is really on that short term kind of day to day where we're also striving to make higher level system change and impact. So our direct impact programming are those things that we can measure year to year. Um, and last year, um, you can see the variety of crops that we handled primarily through our gleaning programs. Um, the volume, uh, just over 65,000, almost well, 65,500 uh, pounds. There's those 1,500 dozen eggs, um, vegetable starts, um, and then one bouquet of flowers. I'm not quite sure who the lucky recipient was of those, but hopefully it was a senior meal site. Um, in addition to the grid uh, that's colored of crops, we had 28 additional crops with volumes less than 500 pounds. Um, and then also some smaller donations of meat. And then you can see the total economic value um, of that 65,000 
500 pounds of food that we moved. Let's see. So in addition to um, this, and I'm gonna have, an, well, maybe I'll tell you after I, in, I share this slide with you. Um, this shows you the different types um, and the amount of sites that we serve um, primarily through charitable distribution, um, through gleaning programs and collecting donations from farmers and then facilitating weekly distribution. Um, we served 46 farms last year um, and distributed to 50 different food programs. We also brokered nearly 3,000 servings of locally grown produce to two of Vermont's correctional facility meal programs. Um, and again, that brokering is something we're really interested uh, in increasing that, uh, that market exchange. Um, I will indicate again that they, since 22, so sorry, since 2020, we've been in a transition period for our direct um, impact programming. I'll tell you a little bit about that, um, I think in two slides from now. But the work we have been doing that is less visible um, has been that technical assistance work. Um, we've been staffing up our organization, which is really exciting. Um, and we've been securing funds that we've shared with other organizations. Um, we secured monies through the um, Chittenden Solid Waste District, which we um, passed through to three different partners um, to secure physical infrastructure, primarily uh, coolers uh, or freezer infrastructure to help with the capture of surplus food and the movement of this food into the communities. Um, and then we also helped secure $100,000 for the Vermont Gleaning Collective. Um, and uh, some of that has gone out to the Vermont Gleaning Collective members uh, in one-time grants and a chunk is being reserved um, for some vision building, maybe strategic planning, um, probably some branding work and a reassessment of um, metrics and messaging for the collective. So nice segue into the collective. Um, the Vermont Gleaning Collective is an initiative that Salvation Farm started in 2013, um, and it has six different member organizations. Um, Salvation Farm serves as the backbone to the collective, um, but the collective has um, a structure in which it has co-chairs and tries to really engage the members uh, in its direction. Um, Last year, the members of the Vermont Gleaning Collective served in total 178 farms. Um, they collected more than uh, 417,000 pounds, um, oh, I have a typo there, um, of local farm-raised foods. That's more than 1.2 million servings um, of fresh local foods going out into Vermont. Um, they served 186 different food programs. So again, as Salvation Farms is a member, we serve 50 of that 186. Um, this also includes uh, a few sites, a few of the organizations in the collective also provided food to the Vermont Food Bank. So then that also reaches you know, their network of agencies. Um, in total, the Gleaning Collective engaged um, almost 14,000 volunteers sorry, 1,400 volunteers that contributed almost 10,000 volunteer hours, and that's significant. Um, and again, when we think about impact in the food system, um, you know, the qualitative information of 100, or sorry, 81% of volunteers reported gleaning introduced them to new farms, where 69 indicated an increased awareness of local farms and the role that they play in our food system. And the 84% shared that gleaning influenced their relationships with farms in their communities. Now, this work doesn't just move food to people that um, are in need of nutrition um, or in need of nourishment. Um, it really helps build educated eaters and uh, potential um, you know, supporters of local farms, which is very exciting. So to wrap up, um, you know, what is next for Salvation Farms? We're gonna continue increasing our staff capacity. We envision growing our team uh, by about five more members this year. Um, we're going to take our models for managing surplus 
um, assessing the models that we currently have um, and anchoring them in Northeast Vermont. So that's the four Northeast counties of uh, uh, Orleans, Essex, Caledonia, and Lamoille. However, our work is gonna continue to have statewide impact as well as national impact. We just felt the need to kind of come home to the Northeast and really anchor our models somewhere and build the strength of those models. Uh, we're going to increase our minimal processing. And right now um, that is starting to happen uh, through a partnership with the Vermont Studio Center in Johnson, where we're taking surplus and processing it into a frozen product. We're gonna um, really focus on formalizing and scaling our brokering. That's the buying of surplus um, and managing all of the logistics to get it to a buyer. Uh, and most of this food we won't even touch. Um, so it's working with the farmers, working with a third party hauler and working with a buyer and our target buyer is the Vermont Department of Corrections. Um, we're gonna be planning for um, essentially a relaunch of our surplus crop aggregation hub uh, where we did do workforce development in the past. We don't quite know where this will be. So it's really in that exploratory phase at the moment. And we don't know whether it will include workforce development or a second chance hiring model. But that's really important to us that uh, we're providing employment opportunities that really build skill sets. Um, we've started a new gleaning program uh, this last year, the Northeast Kingdom Gleaning Program, a region that didn't have a gleaning program. Um, and uh, so this will be the first full year of operation. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, and then we're gonna continue working with the, and supporting the Vermont Gleaning Collective to use the remaining funds from um, the Hannaford Charitable Foundation. And we are, we, Salvation Farms outside of that funding are making some significant investments um, in the web-based platform we created uh, to support the collective. So that was a lot of information, pretty fast. Uh, hopefully it provided some food for thought or um, some of what you, the committee was looking for. Um, when inviting me, my contact information, feel free to reach out anytime. And of course, as always, um, thank you each for serving Vermont. Thank you, Therese. I love that photo. That's not Harlow Farm, is it? it? It is. It's one of my favorites. It's been on our <laughs> Facebook page for a long time. It's just the colors, the cheerfulness, but it's clear they're in the rain. <laughs> so. Yeah. I, I, I actually pick vegetables right out there. <laughs> yeah. Many, many months ago. Um, thank you so much. Thanks for your work. And um, I'm wondering, we have you know, a little bit of time. I want to make sure John gets in here too. But um, does the committee have any questions for Teresa at this moment? <laughs> Vicki. I, I just like to comment, Teresa, Vicki Strong. I, I'm, I don't know how you do all this. I'm, always incredibly impressed with what you've done and are doing. When you show us the numbers, it's, it's really amazing of the amount of pounds of food, the volunteers, of pulling that all together, the number of farms that participate. Uh, it's really, truly outstanding. And one little question I have, and maybe I've had it in the past, but I'm trying to visualize these farms with the food that they have that you can glean. Do they feel like, I'm sure they feel like they're contributing, but how do they have this much produce just for you to come glean? I love the whole concept of gleaning. It's very scriptural, actually. Um, but how, how is it they have this much food to glean? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, and I like to say that um, seeds are relatively cheap. Um, and, uh, you know, farmers will plant enough food so that they're always meeting the market demand, which means um, at times over planting to as, as essentially an insurance um, so that <clears throat> if there is a weather event or there's pests, um, they, have a, they have a buffer. Um, but, you know, we have all grown zucchini. Um, 
we know how productive it is. Uh, and I think sometimes the available food isn't just because it's extra or um, it's a buffer planting or it's a prolific crop like zucchini or even some tomatoes. Um, you know, farmers grow enough so that they don't have to tell a market that they don't have product and they want to make sure they have the right quality of product. So sometimes it's not an issue of the, um, the, the, the edible nature of the crop or the keeping quality, it just might not meet some other specifications, so therefore it becomes surplus. So in order, again, to meet that market, um, they're going to grow enough so that they have the right quality, volume, consistency. Um, additionally, you know, think about your green beans in your garden. Um, you know, when the first flush comes, they're fast and easy to pick. The second one, they're still pretty fast and easy to pick. Uh, but the third, the fourth pick, they're just not as thick and they're not as perfect. So farmers plant multiple plantings so that they can do a fast, efficient, high quality pick their first, second run through, and then they're going to move on to their next planting. You know, that food that's being left is, is fine. It's, it's actually saving them time not to deal with it. And then that becomes um, essentially uh, fertility for their or organic matter for their soil if they just till it in. Um, the same goes with salad greens. A lot of farmers plant a lot of salad greens and, you know, they do one cut and they'll start to grow back again. Um, and so that second cut may be available to gleaners. There's, it, uh, yeah, there's just a lot of food out there. <laughs> and I would say a lot with the, the storage crops is, uh, so, so a lot of it's just condition. You know, think of butternut, you know, if it has a small spot on it, uh, it, it can't go to market. It might spoil the rest, but it's something that can be used if we have the right uh, abilities within the supply chain to capture it and use it. That's great. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you. Um, why don't we move now to Jim? Sales. Good to see you, and thank you for all the work you've done as well, especially during this pandemic when food security was such an issue for families. Um, good to see you again, Sean. Go ahead and introduce yourself and, and uh, please say a few words. Hi, thank you for having me. Hi, everyone. For the record, I'm John Sales. I'm CEO of the Vermont Food Bank. And also for the record, I love following Teresa. Um, I don't have a PowerPoint and, and she provided all the beautiful pictures of Vermont produce and really gave a great, um, a great recitation of what's happening on Vermont farms and how vibrant Vermont agriculture is, you know, particularly the, the the R2 organizations deal a lot with the, you know, the small, very small to very large um, uh, vegetable, mixed vegetable farms and produce, other kinds of produce and folks who are um, creating meat and eggs and dairy. And uh, there's just so much opportunity in Vermont agriculture, I think still um, for us, you know, there are, like in any market, there are things that are doing well and have a future. And there are parts of our agricultural economy that are, are um, suffering or in crisis. Um, and we just, we need to, to be aware of what's happening in the market and, and make sure we're, we're supporting those places that have the opportunity to grow. I am going to zoom out um, a little bit from where Teresa was and talk more about um, food security in the larger sense in the state. And then what's the food bank up to? What's the situation right now? Um, and then a little bit about what we're looking at doing as the food bank in the next year. Um, so for, first, um, just the, you know, when COVID first hit, because that's the beginning of time right now, March 2020, um, you know, kind of my prediction was, all right, it's going to take a little bit for government to respond to this, and we're going to need a philanthropic response quickly, um, really robust. And actually that happened. It was the first kind of the first six months. Actually, the state did step up with the National Guard, and you may remember back in the airport food distributions and the FEMA MREs. Um, and then you know, the federal government did respond and 
um, through the state of Vermont and with cooperation, really the past year and a half has been a pretty robust response to everything that's happened. Um, the, we've had some great research. We've been really fortunate. A team at the University of Vermont working with some other uh, regional folks have been doing consistent research on food insecurity. Um, and during the, that first year of the pandemic, our food insecurity rate went from about 9.1% in Vermont to 33%. So literally a third of the people in Vermont um, needed some assistance in getting enough food for themselves and their families. And keep in mind that about 50% of the households in Vermont had some kind of job disruption because of the pandemic. Um, it's, it seems like a long time ago, <laughs> but it really wasn't. Um, and, uh, and, and we're, we're now in a position where those, those federal programs, um, the kind of the, the pipeline of money um, and supports are is starting to to finish finish up. You know, there we had the um, the the um, COVID support payments, direct payments that went to families. We had the support for unemployment, the extra unemployment support. We had the support for uh, for rental assistance. Some of that money is still out there. We had a lot of support for businesses to make sure that when through the periods that they were closed, they were able to to not not go out of business and be able to bring back people back to work. Um, and now we're we're dealing with the ARPA funds, and I know you all have been doing a lot of work in in allocating those ARPA funds. Um, and I just want to thank the legislature and and the the governor for the Budget Adjustment Act, which included six million dollars that's coming through the Vermont Food Bank. Um, uh, to buy and distribute food um, throughout Vermont for this fiscal year. So we'll actually be able to go back um, to, to July 1st and then through, through the rest of this fiscal year and apply those funds. Um, the Food Bank did request both to the administration and through the legislature an additional $6 million for FY23 so that we can plan for how we're gonna continue to um, address this, and that did not make it into the the House version of the appropriations bill. Um, and so um, we'll we'll see what happens in the Senate. But uh, it would be great to have the ability to really plan for um, how we're going to work with our Vermont growers um, and um, and farmers and and utilize these local resources to make sure that people in Vermont have enough to eat and have access to that great local food and that we're supporting our, our local ag economy um, during this crisis. Um, so, um, John, yeah. I, had a constituent, I had a constituent contact me about the budget issue. Could you just elaborate um, what happened in the House budget with the food bank or where you're at to try to get in the budget? Could you explain that a little more? Sure. Um, yeah, the, you know, there were a lot of discussions um, in the Appropriations Committee. Um, the, the food bank's request did make it from the Human Services Committee's me budget memo to the Appropriations Committee. So it was on the table in the Appropriations Committee. Um, and really, you know, as, as those things go, lots of conversations and it always kind of comes down to the end, the end conversation. And um, the best my best information is that the committee just felt as if the, the, the food bank had just gotten the $6 million in budget adjustment um, and that there were, you know, we had gotten the McKinsey Scott gift and that there were other funds available um, and, and that there were other priorities because it's always a balancing act. Um, you know, our, our position is still that, the, and I, I talk about this a little bit, that the, this, this crisis is not behind us, particularly with food insecurity, which is really economic insecurity. It's about families not having enough money to buy the food that they, they need to live that active and healthy life. Um, we'll, we're gonna continue to, to talk to the Senate um, as the budget bill goes to the Senate and, and see if we can um, get some movement there. Um, and you know that's kind of where we are right now. Um, actually, I can, I can pivot and talk about 
about that a little bit um, because we're transitioning, it feels like from that, that kind of surge of government support back to the philanthropic support. And what we know, you know, from the last recession and from any crisis is that food insecurity has a much longer tail. Um, the, you know, if you read the Wall Street Journal, the economy will come back um, and, and we'll be talking about growth well before um, people are, you know, have, ha, are, aren't seeing the, the impacts of food insecurity. Um, it's both a leading and lagging indicator of a poor economy. And, and so we see this, the, the extended need continuing for the next couple of years. Um, and the food bank wants, you know, we, we will insist on being there. Um, and we want the state as a partner um, because we don't think that this is just the responsibility of our th philanthropic donors to make sure that everyone in Vermont um, has that food that they need to eat. Um, I, you know, the, the economic unpredictability, particularly for people um, who have lower incomes um, is going to continue. Um, you know, I, I was talking to a donor yesterday, actually, um, uh, who's kind of a prominent person in Vermont. And we were talking, uh, the donor was saying, and this is something I heard, well, there were all kinds of, you know, people got um, pandemic payments, they got extra uh, unemployment, they got housing assistance. Why is, why are people still struggling? What's going on? I can drive down Shelburne Road and I can see, um, you know, people looking to hire on both sides of the road. Um, why can't people just go out and, and, you know, get a job? And this donor actually ended up answering their own question by talking about um, something Let's Grow Kids has been talking about to, to purchase high quality um, childcare for your child uh, takes about $12 an hour. It's about $24,000 a year for high quality childcare. Um, if you buy a, um, a gold or platinum plan um, from Blue Cross Blue Shield um, and, and pay for that out of your pocket, that's about $24,000 a year. So that's another $12 an hour. So just for childcare and healthcare, that's $24 an hour. Um, that doesn't include rent. That doesn't include transportation. That doesn't include food. And making $15 an hour working at Wendy's, frankly, doesn't cut it for those families. And so we're still in this period of rebalancing. And there still is, um, still are families out there who don't know how they're going to be putting those and tying those ends together. Um, I'll just share a quick, another quick story. I just heard this today. One of our staff members was talking to, to the person that runs Fairhaven Concerned, which is a, a food shelf in Fairhaven. And um, what they're saying is in the last couple of weeks, they've seen a new surge in people coming in and their concern now is keeping enough food on the shelves. And it's mostly older Vermonters. Um, and uh, they just have more need and prices are going up around them. Um, and there's a lot of fear again. And so it's, it's a matter of how do we get these people, um, our neighbors, how do we get our neighbors um, through this kind of lingering transition period to a, a new normal, we don't really know what it's gonna look like. Um, so I wanted to also, um, are there, that, did that answer your question first of all? And are there any other on that topic? It answered mine, thank you. <laughs> um, since this is the Ag Committee, I did want to talk about, uh, you know, what Teresa was talking about, the, the food bank's link to our local agriculture. First of all, pre-pandemic, about, I would say probably about 30% of the food the food bank distributed was fresh food, and about 70% was shelf-stable food. Well, in 2021, last year, 60% of the food we distributed was fresh food. Um, and that's for a lot of reasons. Um, one of them is really resources um, that we had pandemic funding coming through. We had huge disruptions in our local food economy. And so farmers were really looking for markets. I mean, I remember early on in, in you know, April, May, um, after everything shut down, 
uh, the food bank was hearing from farmers saying, you know, I got this huge crop. The schools aren't buying anymore. The restaurants aren't buying anymore. I need an outlet for this. And we were able to, to, to come in and purchase that and have it distributed very, very quickly. Um, and that's continued. So I'll just in, um, you may have heard, cause we've been talking for a few years about our Vermonters feeding Vermonters um, efforts, which I'll, I will say back when I started the food bank in, in 2009 and Teresa was there, um, she was actually the one that, that started what is now Vermonters Feeding Vermonters um, and the food bank's gleaning efforts. And so, so thank you, Teresa, for getting us to this point. Um, so in, in 2021, um, the food bank made $1.5 million in local food purchases from local farmers. And that's, that's produce um, from about 150 farms across the state. That's eggs and that's meat um, and dairy, um, buying local dairy also. Um, that includes direct purchases and also what we call our VFV mini grant program, where there are farms that are basically too small to deal directly with the Vermont Food Bank. So um, if we're contracting with a farm as the food bank, we're a statewide organization. Um, last year, it was 17 million pounds of food were distributed. So we need a farm that can deliver, you know, in the, by the Gaylord, by the case to our loading docks so that that food can be sorted and redistributed. A lot of small farms can't do that. And so the mini grant program makes grants of, you know, anywhere from 500 to maybe $5,000 to local food shelves who then contract directly with uh, the local farm. In fact, I've got a, a quote right here. Um, uh, Heidi Choate, small ax farm in, in Barnet um, said, it was a great opportunity to get connected to a great organization, which is HOPE, which is the, the local nonprofit, um, and to learn that we were there to help uh, one more CSA sale made a big difference to our small business. So sometimes those local food shelves will buy, you know, one, two, three, five CSA shares that then get delivered and, and split up and distributed through the local food shelf. Um, that allows our smaller farms to have a kind of a guaranteed market um, and to know that I'm going to have these five CSA shares because Hope is getting a mini grant through the Vermont Food Bank. Um, next year, we're actually increasing the amount that we're spending in local farms and through VFV. I'll give you some, just, just a few quick numbers. Um, so next year, where's the 21? Um, next year, our plan is to spend um, $151,000 just on eggs. And by the way, um, eggs, the cost of eggs from Maple Meadow Farm has gone up. Oh, I wrote it down. I think it was, um, I think it was like 60%. Um, but we're continuing to purchase um, because we need that protein to distribute. Um, so $151,000 in eggs, $83,000 next year to purchase chicken, um, pork, 32,000, ground beef, 105,000. Um, ground turkey, $21,000, milk, $8,000 that's already been pre-purchased. All of this is Vermont food from Vermont growers and Vermont processors. Um, and it's all going to our neighbors, our Vermont neighbors in every community across the state. Um, it's, I, I think it's essential not just to, to feeding our neighbors, but to supporting our local ag economy and growing it. Um, one of the things that the food bank can do is be a flexible customer. Um, I got an, another, another quote here from um, Silas Doyle Burr at the Last Resort Farm in Moncton. Um, and he is talking about, thank you so much for your role in making our produce available to the local community, especially those in need. Um, our experience working with you this season really saved our operation as we lost so many accounts due to the pandemic. The flexibility provided also helped us out a great deal. 
um, as the simplicity allowed us to ease the complexity of pivoting strategies. And what that means is, you know, if they get someone who says, hey, I want to buy all your carrots, um, but then there's, and we had said we want carrots, but then there's onions or, or butternut squash, we're fine to buy that because we don't, we don't need any one certain product at any one certain time. Any kind of local fresh food we can distribute quickly and efficiently um, in a Vermont community. Um, and so we, at least right now, particularly during these, these transition and very challenging times, um, the food bank sees ourselves as a partner to organizations like Salvation Farms. And we're really proud to partner with Teresa and, and Salvation Farms and so many others um, all across the state. Um, and we, it, it takes a lot of resources to do this. In fact, the amount of federal food we'll be getting this year will decrease. And the amount of donated food has been pretty much flat since the pandemic began. Um, and so the, the access to, um, to state funds and to federal funds through the state is critical to keep this really um, uh, expanded level of effort going um, for this next year or maybe two. I'll leave it at that and love to hear if uh, the committee has any questions. Well, thanks, John. And um, I really appreciate the work of both of you. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll take this moment to do a little advertisement <laughs> and say that both of your um, both of your organizations rely on donations. So anybody out there in TV land, YouTube land, uh, who wants to donate, uh, I'm sure that you can Google either the Block Food Bank or Salvation Farms and find a way to donate. Mm -hmm. um, and because we really appreciate your good work. We're going to have to go on the floor of the house in about 15 minutes, but we can maybe do a question or two if anyone has one. Maybe. Hi, for both of you, I'm curious about the issue of grains that we may be seeing shortages, from, you know, depending on transportation or political situations in the world. Uh, oats, wheat, just things like corn. But is there anything on your radar about that? Are you hearing about any shortages and and um, availability or anything at all? I'll, I'll go first quickly. Um, we're very concerned. Everyone knows that food prices have been rising um, significantly, um, even, even prior to the war in Ukraine. Ukraine is one of the top wheat producers and the number one producer of sunflower oil in the world. Um, this is definitely going to have a, an impact on food prices. Um, at the national level, we're um, engaged with our national organization, Feeding America, and we're all really concerned about the fact, first of all, that food banks across the country have been purchasing a lot more food um, during COVID, and, and that now that the food that we're purchasing, as well as the food the people that we're serving are purchasing, is much more expensive. Um, and... What, what is going to happen? I don't know. What we're, what, one of the strategies that we're working on is to work with the USDA um, to make sure that USDA, through its, there's several programs um, which they pr provide food to communities, um, TFAP and CSFP and some other acronyms, um, to make sure that they're maximizing their purchases so that uh, food banks have access to that food. Um, and, you know, like everyone else, we're it's kind of waiting to see what the impact is. Mm -hmm. Teresa, do you want to comment on that? Um, um, yeah, I think I think John, I think John did a great job um, speaking to you know kind of the the issue um, at the moment. But I you know, supply chain disruption is not pretty. Although it does allow us to peek under the hood and think about how we could be investing and doing things differently. And, um, you know, I think, well, we love our dairies and we want dairies in our state. Um, we have a lot of land base that grows cow corn that could be growing different food, food items, grains, dry beans um, that could support our diet here. So, I mean, you can't swip, flip a switch and make this change, but I think, you know, as we look at disruption, um, what is the opportunity that's um, held within it? 
So again, I think John, you did a great job. It's a little scary <laughs> um, what we're looking towards, but um, we have a lot of resources here that we can think creatively about. Yeah. Yeah, we've been hearing from uh, Alan Kaler about New England feeding New England. Uh, and that's, you know, that's a really exciting development as well. You know, as we as we think about uh, climate change, other pandemics, uh, wars, you know, uh, what things it would potentially have an impact on our situation here. Um, John, if you have a quick question, we can do that and okay. then we'll probably wrap this up. Um, but go, go right ahead. Um, John, I was just thinking of we're in the era of the story now, oftentimes, and now the late habit will put up pictures of farmers on their tractor trailers. And I was thinking, you must have examples or, or certainly uh, thoughts about if you could connect a donor to a specific farm to, you know, pay, say, for, for milk, you know, above even market um, cost, because that helps the farmer, it connects the donor to the farmer in a personal way. And then you can distribute it, and, and it's a good story all around. I just wondered if in, in those harder, um, you know, things like protein, like meats, dairy, eggs, if, if you've done that. And I'd love to hear some stories about that. Yeah, you know, not so much trying to, to fundraise around a certain farmer, but certainly, um, you know, farmers as partners and, and telling the farmer stories. Um, you know, the, the food bank runs gleaning programs in a couple of communities also um, in um, in Brattleboro and in the Rutland area and some in Chittenden County, um, you know, and, and works with the gleaning collective um, partnering. Um, and there are there are some farms that are doing things like um, uh, CSA shares where you can you pay a little extra and then they'll produce extra food and that will go to the local food shelf. So if there are efforts like that, that are sort of focused on one farm, we like to try and connect, keep that in the community and connect it right to the local food shelf. And so um, we basically using the storytelling are telling the story of, of our farmers writ large across the state. Um, and I know when, you know, as we've been talking to the legislature about about financial support for Vermonters feeding Vermonters. We've had, been having some of our farmers coming in and testifying. Um, and, and certainly they're very eloquent about the, the impact that this kind of forward contracting that the Vermont Food Bank's doing has on, you know, not just their, their operations, but their ability to, to expand um, and to know, okay, I can, I can plant another acre next year because I know I'm going to have this guaranteed contract from the Vermont Food Bank. Thank you. All right, I think we have to wrap it up here. I want to thank you both, John and Teresa, for joining us today. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. And uh, we certainly appreciate you and your time. Mm -hmm. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everyone. Thank you all. Tomorrow. Thank you. Take care. Good to see you, Teresa.